Welcome back to our year-long VHI series of events on our theme, The Dynamics of Disagreement. As many of you will know, um, we're trying to tease out and analyse uh, different forms of agreement, and especially disagreement, um, to explore a hunch that we may have forgotten uh, the essential virtues of disagreeing reasonably and productively, trying to move beyond the noxious binaries of, the, of a zero-sum logic which seems to be proliferating around us, uh, uh, especially at the moment, uh, uh, most visible perhaps in the last year in various political spheres. Through this lens, we've already looked at, uh, for example, the philosophy of Wittgenstein, migration, Catholicism, and the law. Today, I think we're going to consider how various kinds of liberal pluralism might fuel easy but perhaps unhelpful answers to disagreement in the public sphere and try and think through other, hopefully better, possibilities. To help us do this, we're extremely honoured and delighted to have uh, Professor Terry Eagleton with us today. Uh, I, I first met Terry about six or seven years ago when we both spoke at a conference in honour of a mutual friend, uh, Dennis Turner, whom some of you will remember that came to speak at the VHI last year. Terry gave a brilliant lecture at that conference on whether Marxism is a theodicy, and I thought it would be great to invite him to the VHI. Uh, Professor Eagleton is currently the Distinguished Professor of English Literature at Lancaster University, having previously held professorships at the Universities of Oxford and Manchester, along with visiting posts at many other universities around the world. He's the author of over 40 books on a mind-bogglingly wide number of subjects, the most recent of which, Materialism, is just out, and is, I think, a plea to take the real material world more seriously, to join up the theoretical and the practical with the ethical more closely, the kind of thing we aspire to do here at the VHI. Slightly more buried in his long list of publications is the fact that Terry was editor of the subversive Catholic journal Slant, which started here in Cambridge, and tried, I think, to bring together Catholicism with a radical and more effective social and political thought, not again a million miles away from what we're trying to do here. So we'll follow our usual format. Uh, Terry will speak for about 15 minutes, an hour, and then we'll have about, about half an hour for questions from the audience, and then move over there somehow through the chairs for drinks uh, and more informal interactions. So Terry, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and finding time in your busy calendar to come. It's a huge honor, and we look, look forward to hearing you on how to disagree without being a liberal pluralist. Can you hear that? Okay. Is that all right? In the back? Yeah? Yeah. Um, everything Philip said was luminously true, except I think it's 50. Oh. I don't know why I even <laughs> mentioned that. But, but I have a sort of superstition about not counting them, so maybe he's right. <laughs> I suppose it's, it is, isn't it, a well-established proposition that disagreement involves agreement. That's almost a cliché. Uh, in the sense that you have to agree on what you're disagreeing over. I mean, if you think that Synecdoche is a figure of speech, and I think it's a small town in upper New York State, <laughs> then a lot of what we say about it to each other won't even be intelligible enough to constitute a disagreement. Um, we can't agree or disagree, for example, on what, how far Synecdoche is from Boston, because figures of speech are at no distance from Boston, which isn't to say they're in Boston either. If Donald Trump and Jeremy Corbyn disagree about the nature of capitalism, then they must in some sense be talking about the same thing. Yes. Otherwise, their views would simply be incommensurable with each other, which is a matter neither of agreement or disagreement. Speaking of uh, <coughs> New York State, I was, one, I was once lecturing in Syracuse in New York State, uh, and they asked me had I been there before, and I replied facetiously that I had been to that place in Sicily, but not the real Sicily. <laughs> they laughed in a strange kind of way. <laughs> um, there's an intriguing passage in, in Wittgenstein's philosophical investigation, I keep finding myself going back to, in which as a, as a result of something he's just been saying, I can't remember actually, doesn't matter what it was, he imagines his interlocutor saying to him, so you're saying the truth is just a matter of opinion. And he gives 
but a very extraordinary interesting answer to that, not a direct reply, since, you know, like a good psychoanalyst, Wittgenstein very rarely gives a direct reply. I think it's nothing if not oblique. But he says, in answer to that, he says, it is in language that we agree or disagree, and language is not a matter of opinion, but of forms of life. It is in language that we agree or disagree, and language is not a matter of opinion, but of forms of life. Language in the later Wittgenstein, I'm not saying anything very new here, I think, is bound up with what we get up to, with our material practices and institutions, as a recently published, utterly brilliant little book called Materialism um, <laughs> uh, makes clear. Um, and it makes sense for Wittgenstein only in this practical context. In the beginning was the deed, he says, repeating Goethe, also actually repeating Trotsky, though I don't think he probably knew that. Um, it's what we do, he says in his book on certainty, that lies at the bottom of our language game. You and I can't agree that Synecdoche isn't a town unless we share some rough idea of what a town is. And knowing what a town is isn't, of course, just an intellectual matter. It's bound up with our whole way of life, a way of life which, as small children, we grow into and thus acquire the knack of how to speak, of how to mean. We know that what we're in is known as pain, for example, because we've witnessed a lot of pain talk and pain behavior around us as we've been growing up. But of course there are different and conflicting forms of life, so that doesn't solve the problem entirely, which is one reason why agreement isn't as straightforward as some liberal rationalists would seem to imagine. It's because we're agreeing or disagreeing about a great deal more than language, or if you like, it's because language is about a great deal more than language, that we can soon find ourselves at loggerheads. It's not just a question of a certain kind of rationalist seems to imply of my saying it again, but this time more slowly, more lucidly, you know, so that you can grasp it better. The fundamental re reason why we may diverge, not inevitably, but possibly, is that we see the world differently, that we have different forms of life, and when we see the world differently because of the pressure of certain kinds of material interests, we call that kind of dissension ideological. Not all dissensions between different forms of lives are ideological, they like to be cultural, but that particular one, I think, when the discussion is, as it were, warped out of true by virtue of the pressure of certain kinds of often quite deeply unconscious, <coughs> invest vested interests, then we, we refer to that as ideological, and we know, we can sometimes tell we're in the presence of ideology because of a sudden in a, unaccountable drop in intellectual temperature, <coughs> when, for example, a most subtle and perceptive <coughs> of people announces in the midst of a grave economic crisis that the unemployed could find jobs easily enough if only they looked hard enough. You know, when genuinely intelligent people come out with nonsense like that, you know that some other set of factors must be at stake. And how do you respond? Well, of course, you might try to put him right. You might quote evidence and statistics. But you have to do so, I think, in the awareness that the kind of conflict you're touching upon runs much deeper than reason, rather as love runs much deeper than reason. Which is not to say that love, either love or ideology are nothing to do with reason, just so that they run deeper. It's, it's not, as in a good old Catholic doctrine, that love and reason are at odds, simply that unlike love, reason doesn't go all the way down. Without it, we perish. But nevertheless, it doesn't go all the way down. So that imagining you could simply say, argue someone out of being a fervent Trumpite would be as futile as a psychoanalyst imagining that you know, he could cure somebody's hysterical paralysis by just telling them it was all in the mind. Um, my point, uh, as far as my point about ideology goes, you can't just argue it rationally. Some might call that defeatism politically. I think I would call it realism. So trying to convince me of certain propositions, for example, 
that Nigel Farage is a closet hippie who smokes dope every evening in a transgender nightclub in Luton <laughs> while reading a spot of Kierkegaard. Um, you know, would demand such a fundamental change in my experience of the world that I'd be deeply reluctant to make it, not least on grounds of sheer indolence. It would just be so much I'd have to rearrange my, <laughs> my biography and so on, my form of life. You'd be asking me not only to change my mind, but to change my identity. And though I know some people who think this, in my case, would be an excellent idea, <laughs> I'm not so convinced of that myself. Um, but to put the point another way, if Christianity, say, was simply a matter of beliefs, one might drop it easily enough. But it's actually more fundamentally a question of something called faith, which isn't unrelated to belief, but which is a different proposition, and by no means so easily dropped. So there's the problem of ideology, for one thing, when we come to talk about agreement or disagreement, ideology which can maim and kill quite as effectively as a machete or a machine gun, indeed, which is probably what will bring history to a close, is ideology. Yes. Um, but there's also, in addition to that, the astonishing fact that in the era of modernity, whenever you care to date that from, we disagree even on the most fundamental questions. And just think how extraordinary that might have appeared to a certain uh, somebody in classical antiquity or in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, one might expect perhaps one would concur on the fundamentals, but disagree on the details or on the consequences. But no, uh, that's not the case. Almost everybody holds that roasting people slowly over fires is not the most exemplary form of moral conduct, not even in the case of Nigel Farage, <coughs> some disagreements perhaps. Um, but we can't agree on why we agree on that, and we probably never will, which is very strange, isn't it? Um, and the, extraordinary, the other extraordinary thing is that in a certain sense it doesn't matter we have the kind of society in which that crucial and basic set of disagreements don't really matter. Well, we easily imagine a social order in which which would fall apart with that case. But as long as you get out of bed and you pay your taxes and refrain from beating up too many police officers, you're astonishingly you're free to believe whatever you want. As long, to be sure, crucial caveat as the beliefs in question don't undermine the very framework which allows you that liberty in the first place. Yeah. So in that sense, in terms of what I just added there, uh, liberal pluralism is a specific form of life and thus, as it were, non-pluralistic in itself. That's to say, in the sense that it can't, for example, allow anti-pluralistic cultures to subvert this framework. The only beliefs it can't really accommodate are those, or can't allow them to be realized, are those that might do just that, that might undermine that very framework. Otherwise, as I say, you're free to believe what the hell you like. And of course that this is so is on, in one sense an inestimable gain. It belongs to the precious achievement of liberal society. But, less preciously perhaps, uh, it's also because belief isn't really all that important anymore. Late capitalism is an intrinsically faithless form <coughs> of life. I mean, even if everybody on the floor of Wall Street was a born-again evangelical, it wouldn't make any difference at that point. Late capitalism, the market, is intrinsically faithless. Uh, it's not conviction that holds advanced capitalist society together, as it's what holds the Lutheran Church or the Boy Scout movement together. I was thinking, I was talking recently yesterday in Oxford to somebody about, who mentioned St. George, and I was talking about the dreadful death that uh, St. George met, which is so awful, I could hardly regale you with the details, you know. But then I added that in addition to that, they made him patron of the Boy Scout movement, which is sort of final and big thing in the <laughs> uh, It's not conviction that holds this kind of social order together. Somebody once asked Boris Johnson, did he have any convictions? And he said he thought he'd pick one up for speeding. 
Um, and that's fortunate. In a sense, it's fortunate that our kind of political state um, isn't held together by belief because you know, it might otherwise be in dire danger of falling apart. The drawback there, what holds things together is part. Yes, the, 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 the many drawbacks of that, one of them being that political power must be ultimately coercive, which is never the best way, of course, of keeping the show on the road. Um, this is why power, to be effective, needs to bed itself down in something which is non-coercive, something which is more tangible, perceptible, immediate, palpable, existential than itself, and that is known as culture. That is known as culture. Culture is a place where power sediments itself, naturalizes itself, bends itself down. Culture in the everyday sense of the word, in the sort of anthropological form of life sense of the world, is, um, is what men and women are prepared to kill for. Culture is what you are prepared to kill for, or die for. Not many people are prepared to kill for Bach or Beethoven or Schubert or so on, but except for a few very weird people hiding out in caves somewhere too shy to come out and face the rest of us and be ridiculed. But culture in the broader sense, most certainly, I think, is something that people will die for. So one can see the dangers of an excessive pluralism from the point of view of the state, of the whole medley of cultures and subcultures which exist cheek by jowl, if those forms of life interpret power, law, and authority differently enough, it might be hard to sustain the coherence and communality on which any complex civilization depends. So a liberal society is always a trade-off in a sense between those two categories. The market, however, doesn't really care about belief. It's faithless. It doesn't care whether you're a Buddhist or a Baptist as long as you buy the stuff it has on offer. Consumerism, the market is wonderfully liberal-hearted, generously all-inclusive, pluralistic, heterogeneous, all of those other you know, hurrah words in postmodern society. Nothing is more hostile to rankings and hierarchies and exclusivisms of those kind, strict distinctions, binary oppositions. Nothing is more hostile to that than the commodity form, which in its promiscuous fashion will cuddle up to anybody who has the money to buy it. <clears throat> what happens, of course, in the in the course not of course, but what I think happens in the course of uh, Western modernity, later modernity, not not a, not a, early modernity, where you know when when, a, when the bourgeois class is still trying to consolidate itself, achieve power, it goes under all kinds of flags of belief and progress and science and reason and guidance and so on. When that class, however, arrives at the point it has now when it's no longer a revolutionary class, all of that can be left behind, and belief becomes a sort of private affair. What happens, it becomes like you know, collecting porcelain, or you know, making life-size statues of the Sacred Heart, or you know, something of that kind. What happens in the course of the birth is a really different, a different lecture. The, the, the three most vital areas of what one might call dimensions, of what one might call the symbolic area of society, Religion, by far the most important historically. Sexuality, second most important. And the arts, not that important. <laughs> All become privatized in their different ways. All of them become privatized. And that is, on the one hand, a magnificent liberation from various controlling, centralizing, dominating forces, as well as being a spiritual catastrophe. And I hope by that admirably judicious formulation, I please everybody. <laughs> but part of what happens in late modernity, in our own times, pretty late actually, is that this extraordinary idea that conviction itself is an incipient form of dogmatism. That conviction itself is potentially authoritarian. There is a certain kind of postmodern attitude. Uh, that kind, which is, of course, the reason why, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, why so many young people these days use the word light every four seconds, because to say uh, it's nine o'clock sounds 
unpleasantly absolutist and dogmatic. <laughs> <laughs> life at nine o'clock is suitably tentative and provision, provisional and so on. So it's all part, as it were, of a generally sceptical culture, of a late capitalist scepticism, in which belief isn't only in a way superfluous, as opposed to the absolutely <coughs> vital grand narratives of an earlier phase of the same middle class civilization. It's not only superfluous, it can be undesirable. Belief is, is controversial. Belief is divisive. You don't want that, ideally. Um, so that if you happen, for example, to be a religious type, then it's best not to make too much of a fuss over it. As the English wit remarked, it's when religion starts to interfere with your everyday life, that it's time to give it up. <laughs> a bit like alcohol. <laughs> Jesus should have taken that advice and saved himself a lot of trouble. Let me turn, however, now more directly to the ideology that really underpins some of, so, much, so many of our ideas of agreement and disagreement at the same, at the moment, and that namely liberal pluralism. The claim that plurality is good in itself is surely absurd. I mean, how many fascist parties do you want? The idea that plurality in and of itself is an inherent good is crazy. Yes? I mean, there may be something self-contradictory about having only one monopolist commission. <laughs> but more might prove to be confusing. <laughs> Much the same is true of diversity, another numinous sort of notion for postmodern thought. A prodigal range of gangland cultures is not to be encouraged. You can't have more than one mother or a pair of ears. And the fact you can't is not a deficiency, let alone a tragedy. Having a well-nigh infinite supply of spouses may throw up the odd problem from time to time. A diverse array of autocrats is not the most desirable a phenomena, and so on. I mean, obvious stuff, the fact that the CIA has a multiple forms of torture at its disposal is not to be commended on the grounds of its multiplicity. <laughs> extraordinary cant, I mean with a small c, not a capital K, an extraordinary cant about diversity and plurality and heterogeneity and so on. Um, to claim that they're goods in themselves, always and everywhere to be preferred to the singular, is an emptily formalistic proposition, and also, of course, a universalistic one, not least from the lips of those who are deeply suspicious of universal or universalist formulation. <coughs> well, you might claim, uh, plurality may not be everywhere and always a good in itself, but um, surely it is when it comes to the social and political sphere. <coughs> that isn't true either. <coughs> it wasn't difference and diversity which brought down apartheid in South Africa or brought down the neo-Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe. It was solidarity, which is not necessarily at odds with difference and diversity. It was solidarity that politically brought them down, a concept which most postmodern theorists, like many traditional liberals, Treat with a certain wariness, why? Because they mistake the solidarity for dreary uniformity. They find it hard to conceive of forms of solidarity which don't slim, simply flatten out human difference. Yet not all forms of solidarity ride roughshod over individual life. The Eucharist is one example, the women's movement, the Occupy movement. Solidarity and uniformity aren't the same thing. And there are certain topics, surely, say, you know, whether we should bring back child labor in whatever factories still remain with us, certain topics on which what we need is unity, not an exhilarating display of difference and diversity. On issues of that sort, the more dreary uniformity we can muster, the better. It's unanimity we need on, if we can get it, then we can't, but we strive for unanimity, not morality on issues of whether children of seven should work a 14-hour day. An old English saying, one much admired by Wittgenstein, maintains that it takes all kinds to make a world. And so I was very struck when he heard that for the first time in England. Somebody said it takes all kinds to make a world. He said that was a very kindly and beautiful saying. He was hearing it, as it were, with strange ears. But not always 
one might add. I mean, there are some kinds which would be far better off without. Yeah. Some kinds of human beings we would be far better off without. Yeah. Getting rid of them as soon as possible would be deeply and utterly delightful. <laughs> yeah. Neo-Nazis, racial supremacists, serial killers, people with restless leg disorder who sit <laughs> next to you on a flight from Sydney to London. <laughs> and, um, Simon Cowell, <laughs> Justin Bieber. I mean, as soon as such people don't exist, the better. And that's not to just taking a rifle to do. I mentioned Justin Bieber, by the way, just to show you that I'm not just a stuffy old. <laughs> I, I know what's going on. I even know who Rufus Swayman is. <laughs> so, not all difference is to be celebrated. Not all polarity is to be celebrated. The distinction between be beggars and billionaires is not to be celebrated, though it is in Donald Trump's America. The fact that you believe in welcoming immigrants, whereas I believe in trying to sink their boats with a few well-aimed bouts of gunfire, is not an invigorating instance of human diversity. It's just the same with that other buzzword of our time, at which all knees reverently bow, hybridity. Uh, no harm whatsoever, let's say, in having a hybrid political organization made up of theosophists, UFO buffs, Seventh-day Adventists, and Prince Charles. Yeah. Just that it will never achieve anything. <laughs> you don't care about it. Maybe you don't care about that. Doesn't it? Nor is there anything in the least objectionable to exclusivity. There are all kinds of people who should be excluded at all costs. Someone might even be here at this very moment. Convicted paedophiles should be excluded from running children's holiday camps. Banning women from driving is deplorable, but shutting neo-Nazis out of the teaching profession is not. Neo-Nazis are, notice, marginal. Long may they remain so. Serial killers are also marginal, unless a lot of people are being remarkably furtive about what they get up to. <laughs> In fact, there's nothing at all inherently positive about marginality, another mindless mantra of postmodern society. A common liberal pluralist view, for example, is that there are various peripheral groups in society who hold cultural deep beliefs very different from mainstream ones and whose values and activities are of a minority kind. And what we should do is afford them respect, celebrating their difference and their otherness and refusing to insist that they conform to the straitjacketing of orthodoxies of the rest of us. One of these margins and minorities is known as Wall Street bankers. Now, it may be that some of the, cust the culture that you know, thrives among them, you know, greed, naked self-interest, triggering an enormous economic crisis by the barefaced defrauding of other people or insisting that they pick up the bill for it, it may be that that's not quite in line with the dominant way of life of most of the population. It's not what those citizens get up to every day. But who are we to criticize these minorities called Wall Street defrauding bankers? You know? Are not all human cultures to be valued? From what arrogantly Olympian position do we pontificate that these men and women are, heavy quotation marks, wrong? My children tell me I always do that wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, swindling other people is what they get up to. It all adds to the rich diversity and plurality of social life. And of course it follows from the same logic that other cultures mustn't foist their views <coughs> on us either. I mean, there are people, for example, who object for some reason to selling children into slavery, which is fine as long as they don't keep, you know, hectoring the rest of us about it don't keep insisting that their position is right. After all, it would be a funny world if we all thought the same, as the old cliché has it. I was once arguing something like this in Dublin a few months ago, and a devout uh, relativist in the audience said that she was opposed to ideas of right and wrong, or truth and falsehood, because she said, as she said in predictable postmodern style, they were authoritarian. <coughs> She didn't say which category she considered that statement to belong to. One of my oldest and dearest friends, the Dominican 
theologian, late Dominican theologian Herbert McCain, was once giving a lecture critical of the, um, another theologian, an Anglican bishop, who was sitting rather uneasily on the front row of the audience. <laughs> I don't want to say, Herbert declared, that the difference between me and the bishop is a difference of emphasis, as though I were leading somewhat in this direction and you were leading, leading somewhat in that. I want to say that I am right and he is wrong. <laughs> or, if he is right and I am wrong. That, I suppose, is the kind of thing that gets a certain kind of liberal and postmodernist rather wary, well nervous, I suppose, which I suppose is exactly what Herbert said. Um, I mean, surely if you have a divergence of viewpoints and social interests, you can meet somewhere in the middle. That's that good old kind of English gradualism and you know, finding a middle point, a swing with the pendulum. If we ever decide to drive on the right, we shall do so gradually. <laughs> <laughs> so where exactly is the middle ground between racism and anti-racism? <coughs> Semi? Um, where is the middle ground between those who think the Pope is a pleasant enough fellow and those not a thousand years distant from where I live in Northern Ireland who think that he's the Antichrist? It doesn't, of course, follow from this at all that one is free to hang one's adversary upside down from the ankles and beat him around the head. It has, in other words, nothing to do with the question of tolerance or <coughs> intolerance which is not the same question as agreement or disagreement. Tolerance and intolerance are really forms of social practice, not, I think, in the first place, matters of conflicting viewpoints. <coughs> to say you are wrong is not, for me, to be intolerant. It may be mistaken, but that's a different matter. There may be, in all sorts of issues, surely there is, plenty of room for dialogue and compromise and mutual accommodation and persuasion and the like. It's just what the liberals and postmodernists tend to forget is that there are some conflicts on which somebody is going to have to win and somebody is going to have to lose. And they don't like that idea so much. Either the Black Lives Movement matter, uh, wins out, Black Lives Matter movement wins out, or the racist police do. You can't really have it both ways. There is no middle ground. One doesn't tolerate that of which one approves. I myself don't tolerate the existence of malt whiskey, for example, but I do tolerate the existence of Tom Cruise. <laughs> the idea of tolerance implies an antagonism. You don't tolerate things that you like, you know, any more than you give up drinking bleach for Lent. <laughs> tolerance isn't in the first case, in the first place, an attitude of mind. Um, as though one strives to be a little more sympathetic, a little more open to arguments that one basically finds rather repulsive. Tolerance is a matter of how one behaves in practice towards those who take up such uh, social practices, and in the case of some of them, we've agreed legally to exclude them, legally to ban them. Uh, in a similar way, love for the Christian gospel is not, of course, a state of feeling, it's a form of practice. If love were a state of feeling for the gospel, then its paradigm would not be the love of strangers and enemies, which it is, because there's nothing much very cosy about that. Love in the Christian gospel has very little to do with feeling at all, only in that debased tradition of romantic and erotic love, rather than love as agape or caritas. Have we come to make that kind of sentimental association in a disastrous kind of way? Um, uh, there will be no tolerance in the kingdom of God, which is not to say that there will be a lot of rednecks around either. Tolerance doesn't necessarily mean trying to see something positive in one's adversaries by moderating one's views or seeking out a common ground, as though you know, there might be something in Scientology after all. On the contrary, there is nothing whatsoever in Scientology, and saying so is not a matter of intolerance. Not to tolerate Sikhs means to oppress them, not to disagree with them. Genuine pluralism isn't, of course, can't be, a question of some endless open-mindedness. Um, 
that's not possible anyway. The human being's absolute open-mindedness is not possible. The creatures like ourselves, who are constituted as human subjects by and large, by certain deep-seated and largely unconscious predilections and commitments and orientations, ones that run you know, too deep, really, for our consciousness. Um, but even if it were possible, um, if some kind of absolute open-mindedness <coughs> were possible, it wouldn't be desirable. It would be a luxury only the socially privileged could afford. There are others less fortunate who need a degree of certainty about how things stand with them in the world in order that they can be free and fulfilled. There's nothing to be afraid of in the concept of certainty, which is only the traditional Christian teaching on faith, for example, is that faith is a matter of certainty, which is only objectionable if you have the usual boring, scientific view of what certainty <coughs> means. You can be certain that you're in love, or you can be certain that Schubert is a better songwriter than Noel Gallagher, or that David Bowie wasn't the very paradigm of human humility, or something like that. Nothing to be afraid of in saying so. Um, Coexisting pluralistically with other people doesn't mean trying to be less convinced about one's own beliefs, trying to be more agnostic and provisional about them. It, needn't, it might mean that, but it needn't mean that at all. There is, of course, a bogus kind of pluralism, which holds that, well, effectively, though it's not often said outright, but holds that a point of view is to be respected simply because it's a point of view. You know, but it is your point of view, after all, and I respect that point of view. One doesn't, of course, agree with those who hold that Jews are inferior beings, but one should respect their case, even so, recognizing that they advance it with honesty and integrity. It's hard to think of a more pathetically disingenuous point. Almost every odious viewpoint one can think of has been touted by somebody somewhere at some time or other. There are still South African right-wingers who regard Nelson Mandela as having been evil, for example. To tolerate a case is not synonymous with respecting it. One can accept that there are other opinions around the place and that they have a right to be expressed, perhaps within certain legal limits, while repudiating them as vile and saying so as loudly and forcefully as possible. The Christian gospel is a relentlessly uncompromising affair. In fact, there are only really two major objections, in my view, to the Christian gospel. One is that if there is a God, then he must be hopelessly in love with Donald Trump. It is so absurd a proposition you know, that it's a knockdown argument for atheism. Uh, the other objection is that the gospel may require one to abandon one's family and possessions and face the mere certainty of a squalid death in the name of truth, friendship and justice. Who on earth in their right mind would sign on for that? Truth in its eyes is not fundamentally pluralistic and many-sided, but a cutting sword which shears through domestic ties, turns parents against children, and sorts the sheep from the goats. Either you feed the hungry or you don't. As far as I can recall, Jesus doesn't say there are all kinds of ways, truths, and lives, and I happen to be just one of them. <laughs> Difference and diversity, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, master, servant, are not as vital for the gospel as our common humanity. But of course, you might perhaps disagree. Thanks very much for a wonderful lecture, securing lots of our sloppy thinking on postmodernism, liberalism, and various other things that's on the way. Thank you very much indeed. There's plenty of time for questions from the audience, so who would like to start? Yeah. Thank you so much. It was indeed very stimulating. There are so many questions I would have. But then I'm just going to concentrate on one issue, because 
And then just going to talk a little bit about my small world when we use the notion of pluralism, because we want to recognize that there's no single good, so the notion of non-commensurabilities is quite key to talk about diversity. And it seems that when we do that, following Rawls and Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, what we are actually doing is ultimately respecting people's autonomy, because you don't want to have a benevolent dictator in society to tell people what they should believe and what they should do. So, as you were talking before about the notion of tolerance, it seems that there are other values which are underneath, there are other values that are important, such as the value of non-commensurability, such as the value of autonomy or agency. And the problem that you have discussed, these authors, they have discussed, which is the problem of being objective or subjective. And they make a very important distinction between simple desires or beliefs or examined reasoning. So one thing is that I can have my strange view about life, but when we start talking, perhaps, and if we remember roles, we might get through reason in a sort of overlapping consensus. And then there's a certain area of comprehensive beliefs, as you know, that we will leave that apart. But it is not simply about pure subjective beliefs. So uh, the only thing I want to say is that if we remove uh, this pluralism, as you are suggesting, are we not at risk of losing these other important elements for social analysis, elements like agency, autonomy, non-commensurability, and even the idea of discussion per se? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I didn't, I, didn't, um, I didn't actually suggest we should remove pluralism. I said that liberal pluralism was a precious benefit of liberal society. And I went on to make some criticisms of your approach, which I didn't hear from yourself. Yeah? Part of what you did was to re reinstate the very case I was trying to criticize. Yeah? The, the philosophers that you mentioned, Rawls and Nussbaum and so on, are all famous liberal philosophers. They were precisely the people I was, among other things, taking issue with. Of course, they are eminent and, and enormously important thinkers. Um, I'm surprised that you don't want to tell people what to do. Why, why on earth not? You don't want to tell people to stop being racist or fascist or stop beating people up. Or... <laughs> I don't understand this kind of thing. <coughs> it sounds grand. I don't want to tell anybody what to do. <coughs> yes. Holding a belief with a certain degree of conviction entails that you think <coughs> that somebody can violate belief must be wrong. And if you want to be charitable to them, then tell them so. I really don't understand the idea that we shouldn't tell people what to do. The idea that that is ipso facto dogmatic and authoritarian is part of the conventional liberal wisdom that I was precisely trying to question. As for autonomy, well, yes, I mean, first of all, first of all, I'm not as enamored of the idea of autonomy as classical bourgeois liberal thought, like roles and so on, is because I think mm. that um, or, uh, autonomy uh, in the sense of, in, in the Kantian sense, let's say, of self-determination, of course, is inestimably precious, not least for somebody who has lived in political conditions which deny you or deprive you of that. But what the liberal tradition doesn't recognize enough, I think, is that much more fundamental to us than our autonomy is our dependency. And liberals don't like the word dependency because they instantly think of slavery and authority and you know, not all. It is, you know, read King Lear. Yes? It is just a fact about the kinds of bodies we are, the kind of material bodies we are, that we are deeply dependent on others, that there are, our very identity is in the keeping of others. Yes? Our very identity. And unless the classical liberal tradition that you're referring to takes account of that much more vigorously and fundamentally than it does. That what characterizes human beings is their dependency and it's from and, and that whatever degree of autonomy we can negotiate for ourselves, and, and I hope we can, has to exist within that context. I think that's what we should emphasize. For Freud, it's the baby's dependency upon its parents, which is the seeds of morality. 
is the baby's um, inarticulate um, gratitude to its parents, which you can't yet verbalise, of course, but yes, which is for Freud where all much more sort of posh and, and high-minded versions of morality ultimately have their material root. It is in the transaction of human bodies, in a traffic between bits of material, as it were, that for Freud, in a very non-grand sort of way, all of that takes shape. And I think there's a similar materialism about the Christian gospel, but that's another story. Thank you. Thank you. Terry. <coughs> Terry, hello, thank you very much in, indeed for, for that address. Um, arousing, arousing critique, and much needed critique of those who would uh, reject the idea of truth with a capital T. I had one slight concern, and that was that in pushing relativism out with a pitchfork from the front of the house, you let a certain kind of Wittgensteinian relativism back in, in through the back door. Uh, and the worry is that, and this I think is a criticism raised against Herbert McKay uh, quite often, the concern is that it's very difficult within the language game, within the Wittgensteinian form of life, strictly to speak about truth with a capital T. It might be more like thinking of the idea that, say, it's true that Sherlock Holmes smoked a pipe rather than a cigarette. There, the sort of criteria for justification we're appealing to are really criteria of correctness within a system. Uh, and the concern is that you're, you're building that magnificent and much needed, as I said, critique of, of relativism on some, on some Wittgensteinian linguistically relative quicksand. Yeah. Um, as far as Sherlock Holmes goes, um, I famously debated a point among philosophers of literature whether Sherlock Holmes had a mole on his back. I'm not actually told that he had a mole on his back, therefore do we assume that he didn't. On the other hand, statements about literary texts are, are, are generally thought to be neither true nor false. So rather very interesting. Um, but you know, we won't talk about that. Um, let me just say to begin with, uh, relativism and absolutism are flip sides of each other, aren't they? They're sides of the same coin, yes. There are those people who think that unless the truth is absolutely apodictic, that absolutely is evident, then we are simply lost in a morass, etc. Yeah. Um, uh, that simply, as it were, an overreaction to a, um, a caricature notion of truth. The word absolute shouldn't um, be such a bugbear to us, should it? As, it, as it usually is. It doesn't, of course, to say that something is absolutely wrong, doesn't necessarily mean it's very, very, very wrong. Thomas Aquinas thought lying was absolutely wrong. But he wasn't silly enough to think that all lying is some dreadful and heinous affair. Of course he knew about white lies and all that. You know. He didn't think killing was absolutely wrong, actually. He thought it was self-defense. So absolute means, of course, etymologically, um, absolved from, let us say, um, there is, is, this, this proposition is absolved from any set of circumstances which you could propose that might justify it. You know? uh, should you burn a baby to death? Absolutely not. And there is no set of circumstances which you might posit on this. Um, very quickly, uh, your point about Wittgenstein. Yes, there, there is a kind of um, forms of life is a peculiar concept in that respect. In one sense, for Wittgenstein, it's um, absolute in the sense of being fundamental. You can't dig beneath it because the very concept you would need to employ to do that would it themselves be part of your form of life. Yeah? On the other hand, uh, Wittgenstein is perfectly aware that there are many different forms of life. So although forms of life, and they change, so although for Wittgenstein forms of life are in one sense foundational, they're a funny kind of foundation. They, they shift, they change, they, they, they conflict, and so on. I, I think, however, one possible way to tackle this problem um, is um, to remember that Wittgenstein tends sometimes to include <coughs> forms of life, anthropological features of humanity. 
It's not, I think, simply a culturalism. Maybe occasionally he implies that. But I, there's, for Wittgenstein, as there are for Marx, you know, there are certain anthropological features of humanity which are constant, which of course take different cultural forms and all that, you know, and, and that has to be remembered when we're talking about truth. Postmodernists like to remind us <coughs> of all the excitingly different numbers of ways we die. <coughs> we believe how culturally diverse death is, but we die anyway. And that's a more important fact. That's a, as it were, anthropological fact. <coughs> Uh, uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, what you were saying about authority interested me. Uh, just, made, just making me think of Derrida's ideas of the force, Derrida's ideas of the force of law and of um, democracy to come. And I was just thinking, what forms of authority can we create that make it okay to tell people what to do? I mean, how do we go about doing that? Well, I mean, first of all, in a sense, we tell each other what to do all the time, don't we? Not by hectoring and barking. That's the liberals' mistake. To think it's always a matter of authoritarianism. Authority is not the same as authoritarianism. And, and yes, as your question suggests, it's very important we spell out the differences of behavior, or protocols, and procedures <coughs> involved in that. But when we speak you know, about the authority of a seasoned militant in the women's movement or in the trade union, that is the kind of authority we listen to with respect. But, as we all respect the listening to authority, we must have rational grounds to do so. Yes. Um, authoritarianism of the kind, you know, believe this or else, simply issuing new causes, issuing dictates, is, is of course deeply irrational. You must be able to reduce grounds, arguable grounds, on which you are suggesting the course and activity that you're suggesting, and you must be open to being proved wrong, and so on. Of course, you must be able to say what would count as my backing down from my position. But that, but to go back to what I was saying in the talk, that's without detriment in the fact that you can still say you know, the whole authority of somebody's experience persuades me that I must be wrong on this. Um, very unconvinced. <laughs> well, it's just what you said before about the limits of reason, and you're saying something there about the authority of experience, which suggests some deeper connection. Um, to and, well, and I guess I, I guess that's what I'm. Well, experience. To. One can't just, of course, experience experience as one can't just appeal to feeling, because that's a form of dogmatism. Intuitionism is a form of dogmatism. Yeah. I just happen to feel it. I know in my heart that there's nobody else in this room but me. I mean, that, that's, again, take it or leave it. No, I mean, an appeal to experience has to be validated by rational grounds. You, this is how, I, how I've learned to see it. What do you think? You know? But um, postmodernism is hobbled by um, the, the error that to try to tell somebody what to do, like, you know, please stop beating that child, is authoritarian and dogmatic which is absurd, yes. But it's a very dangerous position, too, because it means that the only conviction that's allowed, the only opposite to, to you know, as it was, dictatorial opinion, is either no conviction at all, or conviction so feebly held and so feebly promoted that they are very, very unlikely to confront the overwhelming political dangers that we now face. Thank you. Um, it seems to me like the one kind of conviction or commitment that institutions in late capitalist society can tolerate or imagine or accommodate are ones of a tremendously empty formalistic sort. Um, for example, there's this um, hilarious um, recent um, advertising campaign in this high profile gym in the States uh, called Equinox, which also charges exorbitant rates for its spin classes. Um, that in, on these massive billboards that feature these oiled down and um, remarkably, um, yes, um, sweatless body somehow, um, uh, the slogan in all capitals, commit to something. Um, uh, and I think what I think is a hilarious kind of instance of this kind of arbitrary, um, contentless conviction. So I wonder uh, yeah. if you could discuss yeah. the ways in which 
inst what it is about institution, these kind of institutions that um, prohibits them from being able to imagine or take stock of human particularity, the particularity of the, the, the necessary and irreducible particularity of a rapprochement, a rapprochement between the form of commitments and their contents. And on the other hand, the inability to, to conceive of that commitment in any other voice <coughs> than the active, that as if commitments weren't something that, as you said with, on the theme of dependence, that might be false, yeah. that happened to us, rather yeah. than just things that we just right. yeah. voluntaristically decide. That kind of, of uh, commitment to self is, is a form of voluntarism. He thinks if only you, if only the will is active enough, uh, and you're strenuous enough, then somehow you can carry the conviction through. What it ignores, to go back to the dependency argument, is that, in my view, at least most of the important things that happen to you are not things you choose at all. You don't choose who you are, you don't choose your body, you don't choose who you fall in love with, you don't, all kinds of things, yes? And the postmodern and very American cult of you know, <coughs> options, what will the future be like? One postmodernist theory is largely applied, the same as the present with more options. <laughs> not only silly, but I mean radically mysterious. The fact that so much of our life is not a matter is a matter more of being chosen, in a sense, than, than, than choosing. Um, commit yourself in that emptily formalistic way that you describe. Actually, I mean, that's really a kind of slogan of existentialism. Because, you know, Sartre in existentialism is not about this particular kind of commitment, but the idea that commitment itself will somehow invest you in an identity. That's a very modernistic idea. That modernism is riddled from one end to the other by purely formalistic notions of commitment. As late as people like Jacques Lacan, <coughs> who is a high modernist, you know, uh, do not back down on your desire, whatever it is. Uh, admire a character like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, because however deluded he may be, however much a cop-out he may be in terms of signing on for false values, he pushed it through to the very end. Yes. So that intensity, tenacity, become, as it were, substitute modern forms of virtue, once virtue itself, in a more <coughs> classical sense, has been emptied out of its meaning. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your lecture. Um, I wonder, there, there, there's a poster going around that's probably in every college uh, on a notice board somewhere saying, have you been offended recently? I wonder what the implications of your, your talk are for what sorts of things we should or should not be offended by? Um, well, <coughs> what I was saying about um, the fact that tolerance is not fundamentally about um, trying to tone yourself down, as though there's something suspect about conviction itself, goes along with the fact that all kinds of convictions one expresses are going to be offensive to other people. Um, of course they are. So what? So what if the right wing is offended by saying that you know, power and greed and acquisition are not the most noble of human efforts? So what? Um, tolerance, as I was saying, or intolerance, it's not synonymous with that. It's a matter of what we do. You know? Does that then give us the right to hang the right wing up by the ankles? No, I say. No. But um, uh, if being offended means that you hear points of view, expressions of value, you know, which you find deeply repulsive, then you know, I, I do every time I see Trump on the news. You know. But I don't want to hang him, you won't believe this, but I don't want to hang him upside down. Yeah. Why do we always confine, in other words, the issue of offensiveness or non-offensiveness to certain particular areas of social life, yeah? ethnic or uh, gender and so on. And we might actually throw light on this topic a little more if we were to widen our focus and see that certain kinds of offensiveness are not only acceptable as far as I'm concerned, but absolutely necessary. I spent my whole career offending people, you know, the political and academic establishment. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of blood on the floor, some of it looking alarmingly like mine. 
<laughs> um, but we must distinguish between offensiveness in that sense and let's say abuse or insult, which are related ideas but are not synonymous. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just in my final year of my uh, undergrad degree, and uh, I've noticed that in quite a lot of lectures, seminars, academic context, there's a sort of eerie silence where people don't really want to disagree or or even talk very much. Um, and I was wondering if you had any uh, thoughts or advice for people either in my situation or people who might be educating people of my generation for whom postmodernism is kind of in the bloodstream yeah. on how to disagree well encourage good disagreement and disagree publicly. Yes, yes I do run lesson on that, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> facetious again. Um, yes, no, you're quite right. You're quite right. You see, there, it's, it, the thing shifts culturally. I mean, I, I was educated in the 60s and 70s yeah. when um, there wasn't, when, when in a certain sense conflict was the order of the day, or at least there wasn't the same uh, deep impulse for consensus. Yeah. It varies between countries. I always find when I go to the States, you know, that people are much nicer to me when I give my papers. You know, they always say, you know, your, your very fine paper, before putting the toe of the boot in <laughs> a little bit. But here there would be blood on the floor, you know, uh, and, and why not? Um, as long as one doesn't become abusive, something they would have to see, then um, <coughs> this bland consensuality, which actually in the States, has, well, this is another story, has a lot to do with academics seeing themselves as a profession with the same protocols and, you know. Um, uh, I, I, I think he's very worried. I think he's very worried. I, I, I would just advise you to stand up and disagree with whatever they're saying. Doesn't matter what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I had a couple of interrelated questions. Um, so if I understood you correct, you talked about tolerance as being a social practice, as something we do as opposed to something we believe. Um, but I just wonder to what extent um, we can, you know, we have a belief. Um, for instance, I believe that hijab is not part of Europe, it cannot be part of my society. How then do I practice this without existing in, you know, a practice as form of tolerance, without having a, a contradiction with my, with, within myself? Um, so to what extent can tolerance just be a practice as opposed to a belief? And the second question, which is into it, which you know, follows from this, is um, Talal Asad's famous critique of um, Clifford Kirtz, where he would, he argues that this dichotomy of belief and practice is itself a particular Christian um, or and then a, a secular dichotomy that is not indigenous to every tradition on, on earth and so I wonder if um, you know dealing with questions of tolerance <coughs> involves overcoming this dichotomy itself and if you have any thoughts on this. Yes, that's very good, that's an excellent question. Um, I mean overcoming the dichotomy of belief and action doesn't of course necessarily mean not recognizing there is a distinction between say believing something and actually putting your belief into practice. That might be a very important distinction. Don't forget the beliefs in question might be obnoxious ones. And there's a great important distinction between privately holding obnoxious beliefs and actually putting them into practice. Don't let's just think about beliefs that we agree with, you know, think about beliefs that we don't agree with. However, given not, 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 although indeed there's a distinction between belief and practice, you're quite right that one shouldn't um, polarize them too sharply. For example, if you want to know, uh, the, the, the beliefs are embodied in people's practices. We wouldn't call them practices, we wouldn't call them human activity, as opposed to just to something that happens to us, <coughs> unless they engage certain beliefs and values. That's what we mean by distinctively human activity, among other things, is activity which just as it were manifests certain orientations and beliefs and evaluations. Um, and moreover, if you, I, if you want to know what somebody really believes, then it might be wise to look at what they do rather than listen to what they say. You know, somebody can certainly assert that they you know, 
I don't know, you know, golden hamsters are the dearest things to them in their whole life, and if they spend their whole weekend torturing them, then you would have what may appear um, an unintelligible distinction between belief and action. Yes. But um, it seems to me that it's often quite wise to look at how people, the beliefs embodied in people's actual behavior. That's to say beliefs that may be unconscious or you know, spontaneous, and that we think of belief perhaps too much in, term, in intellectualist terms, you know, what I happen, happen to think or believe. Um, uh, so I, I do, yes, perhaps I, um, perhaps I polarize belief and action too much. I want to draw them closer together. But I still want to hold on to a distinction there. Um, you, somebody can, of course, be one very important concept here, which is by no means now fashionable, but which did a lot of useful work in its day, is the concept of false consciousness. I don't know, many, many different versions of that, but that's to say, it's not always the case, is it, that we know what we believe. Yeah. We might well act in ways which seem to run counter, counter, counter to what we say we believe. A certain notion of belief assumes that we are self-transparent. You know, I know exactly what I believe, it's just that I can't do it, or somebody's stopping me, or, you know, it's not true. You know, I mean, um, we, we, one of the most gloomy insights of late modernity, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, Alice Schopenhauer, is that we are desperately opaque to ourselves, and sometimes much more lucid to other people than we are to ourselves. So the old Cartesian idea that well, at least I know what I'm feeling or believing is just a problem I don't know what you're believing. Of course, it's been overthrown, quite right. So the question of belief itself is a much more complex one. You can all think of, I don't know, you know, cognitive dissonance, as they might grind you, <laughs> where you seem to believe one thing and disbelieve it at the same time. It looks as though Othello really does believe that Desdemona is being unfaithful to him, and he doesn't. So false consciousness there is an important thing to remember. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Eagleton. Uh, this is less a philosophical question than a political question. Uh, you made a, a, a fairly direct reference to the CIA uh, in relation to its, uh, its use of certain interrogation techniques. I just wondered on a genuinely open uh, level whether you had any uh, view, I'm sure you do, uh, from your ideological perspective on the role of the security and intelligence services in a more generalized sense within Western democracies? Um, I, I, I'm nothing, I don't think I have anything to say on that. It's not very boring and predictable. You know. um, like, um, but of course, of course, intelligence and security are vital matters. I've never doubt about that. Um, and they're vital matters for people like me on the far left. Uh, you know, I think as much as they are from the more mainstream uh, centrist. Um, uh, um, and that that's not to be confused with um, with authoritarian and, and the use of torture and uh, the unjust deprivation of human rights. So of course not. But, um, I'm trying to avoid the awful phrase you have to find a balance. But in fact, you do consent. Um, that if people are intent on murdering the innocent, then you've got to be very tough on that. I have no doubt, difficulty with that whatsoever. And I don't think that um, the left should be sentimental about that. You know. But of course, that's not simply the situation, just that's not the whole of the situation that we confront. We confront, um, we can, we confront a surveillance um, mechanism or apparatus. Uh, which is deeply, deeply oppressive and, and is involved in countless injustices and violations of human rights, and that now, frighteningly, that now seems to be built into society, li liberal capitalist societies, and these are other societies too, but certainly, certainly here. One of the um, one of the alarming features of our times politically, this is not on quite the same point, I think it's related to it, is that 
Um, now social democracy looks radical. Social democracy, you know, in the world of Trump, so, and, and of the rising fascistic right, um, the world of social democracy and the respect for civil rights, which some on the left, some on the revolutionary left, were a little dismissive of and sardonic about in years when the left felt that history was with them, you know. Uh, but, but, but social democracy would be deeply welcome in, 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 this, uh, in this climate. Um, but that, um, you know, going back to the question of belief here, uh, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but the world is now divided between people who believe too much and people who believe too little. And the point is that each camp keeps generating the other. People who believe too much, fundamentalists, dogmatists, and so on, and people like you know, Robbie Williams or somebody, or people like a lot of chief executives and administrators and, you know, who don't who believe as little as they can decently get away with. <laughs> and the point is that what we're seeing globally is a backlash of those who believe too much against those who believe too little. But those, the system that believes too little has a very large responsibility in the creation of that backlash. Not entirely, you know. It wasn't the West that forced people to blow other people's heads off. You know? But certainly, you know, the fact that, what, you know, 17 leaders of, of IS right, were actually in Guantanamo Bay, can't be moved. You know, the chickens are coming home to roost. But if you run that kind of system, then people who feel locked out and humiliated and excluded and written over will resort to murderous <coughs> methods you know, to say, look, here we are. And we are now trapped in a kind of frozen dialectic, as it were, between these two different camps, which in a certain sense are sides of the same coin, just as, you know, Trump-type American nationalism is the flip side of uh, transnational globalism. One has to see, it's not a matter of backing one side or the other, it's a matter of trying to understand the logic whereby these two forces enter into deadlock. Thank you. Um, I don't have a very well uh, thought through or figured out question, but I did want to ask you something about forgiveness and the possibility of reconciliation, as it were. It seems like a good time to read Hannah Arendt at the moment, and for Hannah Arendt, forgiveness was so important in the functioning of human societies, because we're always messing up, of course. Uh, the coming back together after it all um, is, is what makes everything function again, and I wondered if, if what you're proposing is that our conception of disagreement is atrophied in some way. Does this also mean, on the other side, that our ability to forgive one another or to, to reconcile at the end is atrophied in the sense that if we think of disagreement, as you, as you said, as, as a kind of drifting off in different directions rather than coming down on wrong or right, um, does that add this further layer of, um, you know, a, a, of a weakening of, of human relationships in that way? Yes. I actually, I think, say that Disagreement isn't a matter of wrong and right. It can be. It can be. Yes, I love this. Um, one of the things I always find genuinely surprising about um, talk of forgiveness is that it always seems to me that people seem to assume that we know or they know what we mean by that. And then the only real problem is how do we do it? Can we do it? Whereas I think that what forgiveness is, is genuinely puzzling and difficult and enigmatic. It's not the same, of course, as forgetting. It's not the same as pretending to forget. It's not the same as feel, feeling warm in your heart about, you know, the person who's just set your house on fire. Yeah. All kinds of things that we, in, in our common parlance, we seem to assume forgiveness is, which, which it can't be. Uh, the, uh, I don't know, but the only kind of forgiveness I suppose is in value is one that recognizes the horror of the offense as starkly and fully as it can. Otherwise, it's a form of disavowal in the sense of the word. Um, now, um, where theology might come into that is that in that sense of actually looking at, looking at the full crime in the face and still forgiving, may be beyond our power. You know, 
do a tour for that, to give him people who massacred their family or so. And of course, it may be very important, just for formal reasons, to say, I forgive them. You know? Because one thing, again, to go back to the discussion of belief and behavior, one thing that signals, importantly, is I will behave in a certain way. I won't seek private revenge. If they, um, I won't go to, I won't ask him to dinner every night. Um, but if they need something, then I will give it to them. Yeah? Now, presumably, forgiveness must be something like that. Once again, we're talking about a kind of practice. But the theological point, in part, should be is that um, there are certain forms of practice of forgiveness which it is almost impossible to imagine one do or anybody would do, um, which I suppose is one point where one begins to talk about the limitations of human beings. Thank you. Um, I have a question about picking up on some of the other ones about beliefs and sort of where the believing is, because uh, I, I wasn't sure exactly where you were coming down on it. You've spoken about how in um, uh, sort of part of society there believing too little, another part believing too much, mostly in terms of the sort of liberal pluralist and sort of late capitalism having been more of a vacuum of beliefs. Um, at the same time, it seems like a lot of the content of what you were saying is that actually there are embedded beliefs in so many of these, um, so that diversity is good and exclusivity is bad and hybridity is a better thing, that actually you're saying, well, it's, it's not saying that diversity is completely good because um, you know, lots of liberal pluralists wouldn't want to include various things in that and would and do in practice exclude lots of other things. And it makes me think in terms of late capitalism, various studies that have been gone, done that when you look at the natural sort of economic intuitions of individuals, those who follow uh, what um, late capitalism expects people to do most consistently are those who are actually in economics classes or business schools. That when you go to other parts of the world, people's intuitions go in different directions and that there is a kind of faith and belief built into um, the invisible hand of the market working things out and if only we uh, you know, acted more truly within the system, it would work out the way it happened. I mean, I've heard people responding to the crash in that way saying, oh, it's not because you know, people were greedy. It's because they weren't properly enacting um, the the principles of, of the system, which so almost strikes me as its own kind of faith and belief. And so, um, do you go more in the direction of saying that, in the strong sense that these other the sort of um, modern, postmodern, so forth, late capitalist way of being is genuinely devoid of these beliefs and structures and practices, or just that? it thinks it is, or that it places the beliefs in a different place than older belief systems such that it doesn't care what you think about God or the Trinity or, or other religious mm -hmm. movements as long as you are willing to be paid for your labor mm -hmm. um, and to pay interest with your loans. Like, so is it, is it genuinely empty of well, belief or is there more what, content there? On what level of belief I was talking about. Maybe I was, it, it's too sweeping a formulation to say as I said that late capitalism is an intrinsically faithless form of life. So there are ways in which I want to defend that. Okay. Of course, the this and that belief carries on, belief in this or that. Yes. What I meant was that it's, as it were, it's a post-metaphysical version of an earlier capitalism, capitalist society which was robustly metaphysical, okay. which indeed thought, thought mistakenly, I think, thought that unless it had sound metaphysical foundations, freedom was a very large, capital letter and progress and science and this and it was found. That turned out to be a mistake. And what and part of the evidence of that is indeed a later stage of the same system, which, as I said in my talk, like many, a post revolutionary class then junks the sort of metaphysical baggage it needed as it climbed to power, yes, um, and finds it can do things better that way. Um, uh, and of course goes on believing in routine sort of ways. But also but I think, as, I think there is a distinction between, as it were, post-metaphysical capitalism. And, um, there, of course, you're right, and, and I'm, this qualifies my point importantly, there are still, as it were, unreconstructed forms, let's say, of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. the invisible hand of the market. But, and I'm sorry to say this given your accent, I think they're mostly American. <laughs> <laughs> that is to say, America, with all, you know, some of my 
best friends of that. <laughs> <laughs> my wife. <laughs> Three of my children. <laughs> but America um, is at once, you know, if you like, probably the most materialistic civilization on the planet and one of the most metaphysical. You know? So that, yes, in the States, the public rhetoric of the States of God and freedom and this great country of ours, our brave men and women in uniform, you know, kind of stuff that in Europe you just stare at your shoes or wait for it to stop. <laughs> like I do when Schoenberg comes on the radio. Yeah. Um, th there is a distinction. But because of its, I think, what, probably largely religious and Puritan heritage, and because of the way it came about, because this is a capitalism which almost you know, is almost within living memory, not quite, but I mean, it's, then um, you have a distinctively different kind of logic long beyond than you do in jaded and old post-metaphysical <laughs> The point is this, sure, you may still need to call upon fundamental values at some point when you feel your system is under threat, but it's, it's bad that you do. You know, the British belief is always, you know, the, the more invisible the ideology remains, the less you wear your heart on your sleeve, <coughs> ideologically, the better it is for power. And one of the great sources, or you know, my great heroes of that, in, in this respect of that belief, of course, is the great Edmund Burke, the greatest Irish political thinker, Edmund Burke, who sees, of course, that orders, social orders that can't actually legitimate themselves in rational terms, because they, like most social orders, they're the result of invasion or occupation or extermination or revolution, but, you know, they have to behave um, in a way which naturalizes all that, which brings it into the bloodstream of society, so that it's what's important there is belief not in the grand metaphysical sense, but belief in the sense of everyday culture. Yes, your everyday intuitions. That's a very effective way of, of buttressing power. Thank you very much for the, uh, the lecture. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sorry if uh, I'm about to misrepresent your position, but um, I thought you uh, I thought you spoke very sensibly oh, about and, uh, <laughs> I did my best about um, understanding, you know, why say we have certain what we call terrorist attacks going on. So understanding that there are certain forms of our way of life that can that can make these things almost inevitable, or, or at least you know you can understand why they they've happened. And I wasn't sure how that kind of met up with what you were saying about forgiveness, because I think I'm right in saying that you, you do criticise, say, I don't know, a strict materialist view that people are only products of their environment, and that's kind of another conversation. And I think it's right that we aren't very clear about what we mean by forgiveness, but in understanding why some people would be led to do things that we might otherwise have an Egypt reaction and be like, oh, this is atrocious. But in understanding, that's not so much just a form of practice. There's something more going on if you can be like, I can sort of understand why this has happened such that when you forgive someone, you're not just kind of acting like it's all right. You're more going deeper and saying, because otherwise it seems that you can, you, you don't, really understand if you you have this undercurrent of well i'm still really angry and yeah. that's awful but i will i'll behave like it's not so yeah. it's like, when you say it's not just a matter of practice one has to be careful not to underestimate the idea of practice there, isn't it? you know you say as it were, it's not just a matter of practice as though practice were just an external set of actions it's a matter of feeling and you know belief but so are practices to, to, as I said before, to identify something as a practice in a human sense of it, it is indeed to say it's relevant to it, connect, it engages beliefs, values, and so on. It's not just, act, um, it's not just an external matter. Yes. We, um, we make a lot of mistakes, don't we? Well, this is, I suppose, straight Wittgenstein, by thinking of our interior life as private, or thinking of our feelings as inside, you know, inside us. But Wittgenstein once said um, to somebody, why, why do people always talk about the external world? That's interesting, isn't it? I suppose he meant external to what? Not to us. 
unless you have a Cartesian sense that the true self is hiding in here somewhere. We are part of the world, yes? Not external to us. So I think the question there, but you're, but you're right. The, when, um, put it this way, the question about understanding, you can understand something and you can condemn it even more because of understanding. Don't imagine that understanding is always on the side of the angel. Yeah? Um, it's a liberal mistake made among other people by the great George Eliot. Yes? That to understand, to as it were, imaginatively or empathetically recreate somebody's condition from the inside and art par excellence can do that is to forgive. You know, to confront the to pardon it, but it's not true, is it? I mean, understanding uh, a situation more deeply might, might lead you to condemn it. Well, ah, now I see just how horrific it was, yes. Moreover, um, there's an important, there's a vital distinction isn't there, continually ignored by the media between explaining and excusing. Uh, so that whenever anybody on Newsnight or whatever begins to say, well, you see, the reason, one of the reasons behind this plot, this gun, this atrocity, was that they've been treating people very badly in Guant. Uh, the commentator will immediately say, ah, so you're excusing it. Yeah? Well, when historians explain the rise of Hitler, are they excusing it? They're two quite distinct activities. To explain not only is not to excuse necessarily, but is, among other things, to say, hey, this might be a way of stopping it happening again. Well, I mean, I live in Northern Ireland, which was you know, in flames 30 years ago. And um, people would say, you know, what do these IRA people want? You know, they're madmen. They're, they're, you know. Well, British intelligence didn't think the IRA were madmen. They thought they were wicked. Maybe they were right about that. But they knew that the IRA had certain kinds motives and projects which from their point of view made sense and they knew that because that was the only way of defeating them. As long as you brand your enemy as some kind of impenetrable mystery you won't know how to go about stopping him. Yes. <coughs> better wrap up the full one proceedings then and allow to have a bit of a, bit of a rest. The, um, thank you so much um, for such a, a witty and incisive, um, and may I say, fine, contribution to the series, which has really shaken up our thinking in, in very productive ways. Um, and thank you for responding so generously <coughs> to